Hi, everyone. I don't usually preface these, but uh, it is an unusual day. Welcome to Know Your Customer Anti-Money Laundering Binance. Uh, we recorded this a while ago, so we don't really mention it, but I just thought it was funny that the week that we were going to release this, uh, lo and behold, Binance is doing full KYC for their customers. So with that added update, enjoy the episode. Welcome back, everybody. I am Cass PNC, and I am here with my partner in crime, as usual, Bennett Tomlin. How are you? I'm doing great today, Cass. How are you? I'm doing really good. It's been a, a weird one. It's uh, August 12th. Weird day for skeptics. Doesn't matter. We're going to move right past it. Today, our topic is Binance, the Tai Chi documents, and how they could be correlated to a lot of what's going on right now. And there's a lot going on right now. I think it's best to start with the most recent news. So Brian Brooks, the CEO of Binance US, decided to resign from the company. Any thoughts on that, Bennett? Many. Brian Brooks was obviously brought on to Binance US because he was the former acting uh, comptroller of currency and so was a US regulator with an understanding of U.S. regulations. It seemed that he was brought on to help ensure that Binance U.S. was going to be a fully compliant exchange that interfaced well with regulators. He left after less than four months, citing strategic differences. Four months seems to be an extraordinarily short tenure for a CEO of a company, and it also seemed that there was no immediate replacement for him, suggesting that this resignation was not planned and was more sudden. What this suggests to me at first blush is that Binance US is in a difficult situation that Brian felt he was not the best to lead them through. Which gets us to another point, and that's if we backtrack before those four months before Brian arrives, we have a different CEO who seemed to kind of vanish into thin air. I mean, Catherine Coley is her name, and she was in charge from the get-go over there at Binance US. And then at some point, they just announced Brian Brooks is the new CEO. Do we have any insight into what the hell happened there? Not entirely. There's a few different rumors and things that have been passed around the industry to try to explain Catherine Coley leaving. There are many who believe that the reason she has been so quiet since leaving Binance is because she may be involved in a lawsuit against her former employer. There have been other rumors suggesting that she may have been responsible for certain documents reaching the press. Or... It's quite possibly just that Binance and Binance US saw an opportunity in Brian Brooks to have a CEO as a former regulator, which would help legitimize Binance US and ensure that it was the contact point for US regulators. It's unclear exactly why Catherine left, but she did and has been largely silent and unheard of since during the tenure of Brian Brooks. I think I was not to... <laughs> At some point, I noticed that Catherine and uh, Brian were both listing themselves as CEO of Binance at the same time, which more so points to the idea that um, everything is being left untouched. She's clearly not the CEO. I, I, everyone knows that. There's been turbulence when it comes to the Binance US situation right now. And that's because there's a DOJ and IRS investigation into Binance US. Is that I, right? Or is it Binance? Yeah. Well, I, it's certainly Binance. I think it might also be Binance US. There's also, of course, the CFTC investigation into Binance and what, 15, 20, 25 different countries who have recently had regulators issue letters to Binance, letting them know that they're not authorized to be operating there. In general, Binance is in a tenuous regulatory situation. I wanted to touch on that before we delve into the main topic. We've seen regulators in the UK, Malta, Singapore, Thailand, the Cayman Islands, 
the U.S., Canada, basically you name the country. And there's regulators who are probably looking into the shady underpinnings going on at Binance. Which brings us to our main point, which is the Tai Chi documents. So there, there were some documents leaked to Forbes back in October 2020 detailing how Binance was using Binance US as this shell company to move cash, funnel cash in and out of the US. Yeah, and it's a bit complicated. The Tai Chi entity described in these documents was meant to serve two functions. First, it was meant to be the official place for U.S. citizens to trade, and as such, attract contact, interest, and other things from U.S. regulators. They also intended for Binance U.S. to proactively engage with a variety of U.S. regulators. The goal being that when these U.S. regulators became interested in Binance, they would instead be engaging with Binance U.S., providing the main Binance Corporation with, in effect, this kind of shield between their activities and their engagement with U.S. regulators. Binance U.S. would pay licensing fees for their software back to Binance, effectively allowing uh, Binance to take a portion of the U.S. trading profits from Binance U.S. and bring them back in as income to the main Binance company. During this time, the leaked Tai Chi documents say, the main Binance exchange would encourage people to use VPNs, or virtual private networks, to obscure where they were connecting from, allowing U.S. citizens and residents to still trade on the main Binance and use leverage. There were even some tweets as late as 2019, where you can see CZ, the head of Binance, describe the value of these VPNs to Binance. Then, the other part of the plan is that this Tai Chi entity would proactively engage with lobbying groups in order to help further send this image of legitimacy to the industry as a whole. That was the plan, and they've executed on basically every part of it in reality with the Binance US entity. We see them hiring Brian Brooks to help them engage proactively with regulators, We see them paying licensing fees back to Binance. We see Binance pushing for the VPNs, exactly as described. And we even see how they try to maintain degrees of separation. Catherine Coley, back when she was the CEO of Binance US, made the claim that Binance, the parent company, did not uh, have an ownership stake in Binance US, and that Binance US was basically this entirely separate entity that was only paying these licensing fees back. Um, However, this is, again, somewhat dubious because we see CZ being the chairman of the board for Binance US, which suggests at the very least Binance has a lot of influence over Binance US's operations. And we did see Binance US join the Blockchain Association, which then prompted Coinbase to leave the Blockchain Association, fearing being associated with Binance US because they worried Binance US had served US clients before becoming appropriately registered as a money services business. I think it's pretty safe to say that Binance US was meant as kind of a regulatory shield and regulatory arbitrage strategy for the main Binance exchange. We recently saw that there was a... uh... Something happened on May 19th, I believe. Is that the right date? Oh, on the uh, Binance futures that went a little screwy. Yeah, May 19th is right, I believe. I just think that there's, yeah, there's a lot of red flags going on here. And the Tai Chi document, which, like you said, came out a while ago, it all seems to be coming to fruition. But the fact that Brian Brooks has departed and that... Catherine Coley has remained completely silent. Do you think there's a reason to feel a little bit of fear and uncertainty and doubt right now about Binance US and and Binance as a whole? I I feel like people think that CZ and Binance are kind of this unstoppable force. I don't know if that's the reality. What do you think? 
I'm trying to choose my words carefully here because I think there's plenty of reasons to be worried about Binance the company and Binance US. I mean, think of the timeline here, right? We have Catherine Coley leaving Binance US and going absolutely silent, Brian Brooks joining Binance US, then we have Wei Zhu, the chief financial officer of Binance, leaving in June of this year, leaving Binance, and then just recently we have Brian Brooks, after just four months, leave his position as CEO of Binance US, combined with us knowing that there is significant regulatory pressure on Binance and Binance US right now, including active Department of Justice and IRS investigations. That's a very difficult position to be in. Besides that, we've also seen as a whole bunch of these countries have issued these letters to Binance that a significant number of banks have started to cut them off. And it becomes increasingly difficult for exchanges to operate as they get disconnected from the banking system like this, because it's difficult then to get money in and out. There's not enough for me to say that Binance is certainly doomed or anything like that, but there is certainly enough for me to say that I personally would not be comfortable with funds on either Binance or Binance US in this moment. From even a trading perspective, I think there's an argument to be made that Binance US has been pretty doomed from the get-go. I mean, in terms of volume, I think it sees... I haven't even checked lately, but I know it's nothing compared to Coinbase, Kraken, uh, other exchanges accessible to U.S. residents. I, I think it was a disaster in some sense, but like you said, it also seems to have played its role according to the Tai Chi documents. And I think it's valuable for us to remember that this was part of the Tai Chi documents plan too. They repeatedly reiterate in the documents that they have no expectation of success in these engagements with U.S. regulators, that it's meant to basically buy time, be a shield, and eventually even the plan was for Binance U.S., or the Tai Chi entity, which is Binance U.S., to end up being consumed again by the main Binance entity. Things are playing out exactly as they described they likely would in the documents. And they've done this before, right? So we reflect on the other... Binance affiliate entities, uh, Binance Uganda, Binance Jersey, Binance Malta. There, there's been many a different Binance exchange that has subsequently been absorbed by the parent company. But the way it felt to me, especially when I saw them doing it in Uganda first, and they opened up Fiat trading on their exchange in Uganda, and then they took it over as Binance and said all of the fiat stuff would still be available for trading on, on Binance. And I think they did the same with Jersey and uh, other related entities as well. So my point being that all of these affiliate entities were utilized specifically the way that they describe in the Tai Chi documents, which is build a fiat on-ramp and off-ramp so that you can acquire fiat in the first place as Binance and then reabsorb the entity and continue that. I mean, fiat isn't easy to come by in the cryptocurrency system, period. Yeah. And so any fiat that you can get your hands on, whether it's in Ugandan, I don't know, whatever they use in Uganda, or pounds in, in Jersey, it doesn't really matter as long as you can get your hands on a little bit, enough to keep the servers running, and people don't realize how important that is and how hard it is to do other than with an OT OTC desk. Yeah, no, I think it's pretty clear that each of these entities was meant to be was meant to give Binance plausible deniability about their connection to any of the individual ones. Well, meanwhile, each of these entities would still be providing a steady flow of funds back to Binance in the form of these licensing fees, as described in the document, and as we've seen with Binance US, so that the main Binance company 
takes the majority of the benefit, with the goal being that each of these affiliated entities would take most of the risk, that they would end up as the primary target for regulators because they were the ones touching the fiat initially, and they were the ones who were ostensibly supposed to be acting in these companies. So Binance can say, no, we don't let US traders trade here. That's why we started Binance US. And we don't allow leverage at Binance US. That's against the law in the US. Meanwhile, Binance US is taking their profits in these trading fees and stuff and paying them back to Binance in the form of these software licensing fees. You don't even need a direct ownership link between Binance and Binance US because the value here is in the fiat flowing, like you said, from these affiliated entities back to the main Binance company. This is where it gets into the criminal aspect of it. So granted, neither of us are lawyers and neither of us are leveling any kind of accusations here. But in my opinion, some clear violations going on there and a distinct resemblance to money laundering. Money laundering to me, uh, uh, something, something that always makes me reflect on what money laundering is supposed to mean is that oftentimes it it's about putting your money into something knowing full well if i put a dollar into this machine i'm going to get 75 cents back but you know what i don't care cuz i earned this dollar in the worst way so getting 75 cents of that dollar is just fine for me and i think about binance us i think about Binance, Jersey, and Uganda, and Turkey, all of these other ones. And I think you don't care if you lose money on that. You don't care because you're getting fiat. You're getting fiat and all you have is crypto and that does not keep the lights on. I think what you're also getting at here is that it doesn't matter to Binance corporate what's happening on these related entities or how they're making money because Binance has this level of plausible deniability and the money they're ostensibly getting back from these entities is in licensing fees, right, for their software, which looks like a legitimate line of business for Binance. They've developed this matching engine. They've developed this exchange software. Licensing that and their brand to other people makes sense as a business. And so long as they can pretend that it's largely just this licensing agreement, they don't have to be responsible for a lot of the activity that's happening on those exchanges. So if, for example, dirty money was coming into them, wash trading, whatever, it doesn't particularly matter to Binance because they don't care if regulators shut down those entities. They want them to exist for as long as they can to pull the money back to Binance corporate. But if they get shut down, that's okay because it's not the main Binance. It's clever. It's really clever. It's really clever and it's really stark. You and I, you know, we just did the Bitcoin episode. There's reasons to be optimistic and excited about decentralization and um, new forms of money and stuff like this. And entities like this and people like this make you realize how dark the dark side is, which is so fucking dark. Yeah. And I mean, some of the lines that Forbes quoted from the document, like they feel Machiavellian and like they really thought through the potentials and the issues here. Key Binance personnel continue to operate from non-US locations to avoid enforcement risks. The Tai Chi entity should be ready to accept nominal fines in exchange for enforcement forbearance. They say that the license and service fees paid by the U.S. service company to Binance are functionally U.S. sourced trading fees. All the things we're describing here of them trying to clean this money and hide themselves from their own, basically protect themselves from their own bad actions, is exactly what they were doing. And they seem to have been doing it with full knowledge. And I want to front run an argument I know we're gonna hear right now. Banks do this shit all the time. You're absolutely right. And that's the most disgusting part of all of the banks and these entities, period. Your number one trading engine is Machiavelli. Congratulations. I mean, I don't know, well, I don't know what that is supposed to mean. I don't know how that's success. If that's success, I, I don't know what that means to, to anyone but CZ, really. Yeah, banks are really bad a lot of the time and do a lot of really shitty things. Don't be like them. The future of finance, just like the past finance. I, it, I see the hero worshiping 
I think people propose decentralization as being a very individualistic concept that choose for yourself and uh, do as you please. And no matter what anyone argues after that, it, that you can't really argue. But I, but I want to say the number one entities, the, the money makers here are Binance, they're, they're FTX, Alameda, Cumberland. These are the guys that are making money all the time, not part of the time. But still, entities like Binance that have no fiat resources, except their, their OT, whatever OTC desk they can find, and equity. I think that plays a huge role in cryptocurrency that most people just don't know about and don't talk about. All of these exchanges have like equity in each other. Yeah, like we know that uh, Binance was one of the first investors in FTX, right? Any exchange or large trader that had money on Bitfinex in 2016 probably ended up as a shareholder after that. Yeah, even the person who allegedly wrote the Tai Chi document runs an exchange called like Koi Trading that Binance is an investor in. All of these entities are so deeply connected and through these networks of shell companies and holding companies and things like that, all meant to obscure how deeply connected this stuff really is. Equity plays this massive role in the system that I don't think, I, like, I think that's being leveraged out of control as much as every, every other crazy, I'm sure there's essentially 125x valuations for equity and stuff. I, it's, it's probably insane. Well, I mean, and we seen some kind of wild valuations recently. Like, look at the proposed SPAC for Bullish, right? The Block One project, where its valuation before they had an actual exchange was at, what, $9 billion? They, they don't have an exchange yet. The idea basically is what? They've got like five and a half or $6 billion in assets or something ridiculous, and they're going to be providing their own liquidity, and so half their value is the assets they hold. But still, a $9 billion valuation on a product that doesn't exist. That's And that's a broader market concern, probably, at this point, I would suggest. Uh, not cryptocurrency alone. And I think the Tai Chi document, I, we'll link to it in the description for the podcast. But I, I think this is just a great document to express how on one level, this is all really simple and kind of seemingly, again, not suggesting this. And as far as I know, none of these entities would ever do anything even close to this. But it sure as fuck looks like money laundering and bank fraud. And maybe it's not. And maybe I'm definitely misinterpreting the law. But from my basic understanding of those, those concepts, it sure feels that way. And I think people are misinterpreting the risk. I agree with you that many of the actions of, like, Binance appear suspiciously like money laundering or may even be bank fraud. And I certainly agree that it appears many people do not feel it's as big as, of a risk as we do. I mean, Binance, or volumes on Binance are still relatively high. Their cold wallets still seem relatively full. There's a lot of people who, despite the last several weeks of action against Binance, still seem to feel confident that Binance will continue to exist into the future and continue to give them access to their assets. Which is a perfect segue, because the, the final point I think I want to touch on is... We saw a $611 million white, white hat hacker hack, quote unquote, no one really knows what's going on there, of Poly Network. Um, and we saw a $100 million CFTC fine for BitMEX on the same day. So we saw nearly three quarters of a billion dollars disappear in a, in a day. We're, we're seeing all of this action from regulators across the world against the number one exchange in cryptocurrency. Does it matter? The price of most crypto assets did not seem to react to those news. So to the people actively trading these markets, it does not seem to matter. 
CZ has vastly more wealth than I can will ever have or can even really imagine. But I would not switch places with him today if you gave me the option. He gets to call two islands home, maybe. One, probably one, because Hong Kong ain't, ain't going to put up with his bullshit anymore. So for now, one island is home. And uh, imagine 2020 for the rest of your life is what I think about. You know? Imagine just never getting to travel anywhere ever again. That sucks. I don't care how much money you have, who you can buy and bring to your island. It doesn't matter. It often turns out that many fugitives and stuff realize that that life is not as great as they thought it might be, including very wealthy ones. I mean, you and I have both read The Mastermind by Evan Ratliff, of course, discussing Paul LaRue, and you can basically see how once he was on the run, like, he realized it often sucked to be on the run and to feel like there's all these places you can't go and all these things you can never do despite the fact that you are rich and you're powerful and you have access to all these things because you can't go to all these places. You can't use your real name. You can't have these connections to lots of other things that normal people get to have, and it sucks. Remember that family you had? Yeah, they're gone. You can't go to see them or you'll get arrested. So you have to make a second family in Brazil. Oh, you wanted to give your mom money? Like, you think she deserves money? Too bad, you can't. You literally can't. I, I just look at certain lifestyles that people admire and relish and think, that's who I want to be. And I just, at least take the time to do a double take before you decide that's who you want to be. Because I don't, I don't think it's all it's cracked up to be. Anyway, thank you for joining us, and that's going to do it.